Welcome back, everybody. You can take a seat. And we will start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today is the feast of St. John Vianney. He is a patron saint of parish priests. And uh, so it's a great feast day for uh, the priests of the parish and in the diocese. It's a great model of what priesthood should be. He lived during the time of the French Revolution and uh, found himself thrown into a church in disarray because of that revolution. Lots of persecution and uh, lots, of, lots of difficulty. And yet uh, was able to, in this very, very small village that he was sent to, uh, redefine that whole people. Within eight years, it was the model Catholic parish of France. And uh, not without the cost of a lot of suffering on his part. But um, it became such a model that people came from all over Europe, almost like what we do today. We have this uh, dynamic Catholic, we have divine renovation, we have all these great programs that uh, we have for the church to reinvigorate communities and so forth. And, and people travel like I did a couple of weeks ago to Dallas, Texas to see what they're doing and to get new ideas and so forth. And same thing was happening back then too. And uh, people were amazed at his uh, way of bringing uh, the parish or people back to life. And for him, it really was built solidly on spirituality. Uh, on coming back to Jesus, but in a very relational way. So we ask um, St. John Vianney be with us and help us in our own path, our journeys with Christ. We may also have that deep, deep love, great relational love with the Lord and through the Lord uh, with the church. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> might remember, um, you know, this was a big deal back then. Um, I think it was 1869 or so forth, that was about that year that John Vianney died. And uh, during this time, this, the church was still dealing with uh, a sort of uh, what they called Jansenism, which was a view of things that were very dark, very difficult, and it took over the entire church really, that sense that uh, we, we're barely going to make it if we make it at all to heaven, maybe purgatory if we're lucky. And uh, that uh, life was filled with so much burden because of it. Um, you remember the Sacred Heart Devotion and St. Margaret Mary. <laughs> and St. Margaret Mary, really the the cusp of her messages uh, from the Sacred Heart were simply, why do people stay away from me? Why are they so cold? Why are they so indifferent? Tell them that my heart is on fire for them, right? And so this is why we have those beautiful images of the Sacred Heart with his heart exposed and on fire. So you might even look at architecture as such a beautiful indication of what goes on in the life of the church at certain times. And back in those days, 1600s and upwards, you have these wonderful Gothic cathedrals, right? Amazing things like Notre Dame that are built. But as you're walking in, what you see over the, the main doors usually is the last judgment. So you have uh, the sheep being taken to heaven and the goats being taken to hell by demons. This is the first entrance. This is what people would see when they come on pilgrimage. They look up and the first image that is presented to them is the last judgment. 
may not know that at one time with the rosary, the last of the glorious mysteries was the last judgment. It's not the coronation. But over the years, and really, I think, because of the Sacred Heart devotion, which got picked up by the Jesuits and became um, the devotion to be spread around the world, um, it really transformed slowly, but it transformed the way we look at uh, God and at church. And, and now in our own in our own time, what is the stress? What would be the big stress today in church or the devotions? There you go. Divine mercy. Isn't that something? Now, it's an interesting thing when devotions um, catch fire in the church. Most of the time, it's not due to the church. Most of the time, it's not due to priests, nuns, bishops or catechists. It simply is something that catches the heart of people and it spreads like fire quickly. That's what happened with the Sacred Heart devotion. That's what has happened with the Divine Mercy devotion too. It really touches people's hearts. And I know somebody who's, who, um, uh, we always uh, tug a little bit about this and he'll tell me, oh, it's too sentimental. Uh, Divine Mercy, too sentimental. And I say, you're, you're missing the whole point. Um, that's exactly what Christ wants. <laughs> he wants it to be so relational. He wants to hit the depth of our hearts. And um, uh, sometimes uh, I wonder, you know, those of us who are uh, involved in leadership and so forth, uh, there can be a disconnect uh, where we, we don't see this so clearly, but you do. And um, that reminds us and so that's how the church moves together. You know, the church needs, um, we need the, the leadership. We need um, those who um, participate in the life of the church in very quiet ways. All of us coming together, this is what creates and sustains the vision. So it's never, never up to just bishops. And it's never just up, up to the people in the pew. It's up to everyone together, working together, praying together and loving together. That's the only way the church is ever successful. So as we're looking at um, Didache, I put church on her two feet because um, it's almost as if you remember uh, in the gospel, even the gospel today, uh, where um, our Lord says to Peter, uh, you are rock and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against the gates of the netherworld. And so that's the, the baby. But now we're at a place where all of a sudden the baby kind of steps up, raises herself up on her two feet. And I'll explore that a little bit more. But we are definitely at a transition stage, I believe, with this document. Hey. Well, it was working. It's a nice picture, but that's not where I want to stay. Oh, Father John, <laughs> fix it, man. Our, our IT. <laughs> yes. One question: Why on earth to? Oh, the halos. Just for a second. Well, just as I'm saying, it's a it's a metaphor. You know how a baby stands on its two feet and begins to walk a little bit more independent, still needs mom and dad, but a little bit more independence. And that's where I see with this document, the church is up on her two feet for the first time. So the um, remember when we're reading between the lines, that's an important um, piece. And when, when you're looking at scripture or anything else, I'd really like you to keep that in mind. 
because it helps to understand always the bigger picture. Okay. So when you have, as I alluded to last time, and maybe we can do a little uh, recap in a moment, but uh, remember I, I talked about how important it was that the church through this document is making an authoritative statement. So up until now, the church has been gathering together letters of St. Paul, Gospels, other letters eventually, St. Jude, and so forth, St. Peter, the Epistles. And gathering these together, imagine, you know, uh, one has to wonder, St. Paul is writing these letters to Corinth and Thessalonica and different places. But did he imagine that they would become so authoritative? And imagine that there are probably some letters that St. Paul wrote that are lost, gone, never, never survived. But uh, we believe by the will of the Holy Spirit and the plan of God, what did survive was enough. So when you're reading the Bible, gospel in particular, um, not all the answers are supposed to be there for every single question of life. Okay. So when we're dealing with nuclear arms or any of the, the great moral questions of the day right now, you're not going to find a, um, a, a direct connection somewhere to an incident or a situation in the New Testament or the Old Testament where we can say, well, this is clearly what the, the Lord intended or what the church uh, or the people of Israel intended or believed. There are some things that certainly will be, but not everything. And so because of that, magisterium, remember that's the teaching authority of the church, Pope and bishops in communion with them. So the teaching authority has to step in and interpret correctly, authentically for the people of God. Okay, so it is a service. And that's why um, the Holy Father is called, remember one of his uh, titles, probably the, the most beautiful, is Servant of the Servants of God. Okay? That's one of the, the wonderful titles of um, the papacy, Servant of the Servants of God. So the papacy is at the service of um, the people. And it was uh, Benedict who gave a wonderful uh, reflection on this one time on the papacy. And he said, the charism of the Pope or the papacy is to be the one who remembers. Isn't that lovely? The one who remembers, that's his responsibility. So he is the one that is supposed to remind the church generation after generation, century after century of who we are. So the, um, this document then is the first that we know of authoritative step forward outside of the Council of Jerusalem, which is in the Acts of the Apostles. We talked about that a little bit last time. Remember the Council of Jerusalem is where um, those Jewish converts are wanting to keep Jewish custom and Jewish ritual um, to such a degree that it becomes difficult to become a follower of Christ. And uh, St. Paul is very much uh, opposed to that. St. Peter gets caught, you know, in, um, gosh, in um, when he's with the Jewish converts, he seems to support them very, very much, too much. And so the word goes out that um, uh, we are not um, moving forward in a way that uh, builds past the Torah. And it will be St. Paul who comes back and says, you know, um, this is new. And uh, we are not uh, in Judaism anymore. And this will be a big transition for the church herself is that this is why 
eventually we, we move from Saturday to Sunday. Right? So Sunday becomes the day of uh, worship because that's the day when Christ rose from the dead. So now no longer worshiping on Saturday, but on Sunday. And um, that is the step theologians say that moved the church into her trajectory, into her future. That she would not be a sect of Judaism, that she would be her own movement, church. So far, so good? Okay. So the next, the next slide. Let's oh, mount that one. Oh, here we go. Okay, good. So just a recap from last time. So I want you to remember just a few things that we talked about last time. You might want to write these down. This is the church's oldest document that we know of outside of the Bible. Most theologians believe that it was written in the year 70 AD, 70 years after the death and resurrection of Christ. But there are some that even uh, suppose that it could be as early as 50 AD. Either way, it contains material we know that is older than many of St. Paul's writings and John's gospel. So you've got to remember that we're at a place where um, cities, places, you know, how do you hear about anything? Somebody gets on a horse and rides. And it's not immediate. So for the church to gather herself and to say, this is what we believe, it takes time. For the church, as we said, to canonize or make canon or canonical the, the books of the Bible, it took a long time. So centuries. And finally, as we said, at the Council of Trent, right after Reformation, that's the, the time when it really is finally settled into stone. Uh, the books that we hold um, to be authoritative for the Bible. So um, one can imagine, you know, um, when the East and the West broke, so you remember that we had the uh, one Catholic, one Christian church, and then uh, what breaks and, and forms are two um, the Orthodox and the Catholic. The Orthodox has some breakoffs to the Eastern Orthodox and the Syrian and so forth. But in general, we have now two expressions of Christianity, the East and the West. And we know, uh, I was reading something um, a couple years ago, that there were some parts of the empire that had never heard that there was a break. And well into the um, 16th and 17th century, they were still thinking there was just one church and nothing else. They were far flung. Remember that, for instance, the Assyrian Church of the East, which used to be the Nestorians, when they broke off, they were huge. And they sent missionaries all the way into China. And so even today, they're finding uh, the ruins of churches in China, not Catholic, but Assyrian, very, very ancient, a sister church, we would call them now. So there was a time when people didn't even know there was a, a break. And then look how human beings are. When they found out there was a break, then they broke. <laughs> they just broke. And now he's had Orthodox and Catholic in that village or in those towns. Unfortunate. Okay. But the importance of realizing that information took a while to get anywhere. And even, gosh, when you look at Martin Luther and he broke away, and then the Pope decides to have a council, which will eventually be Trent, and he says to the bishops, come to Rome. Well, you know, some are riding horseback, some are walking. Some are going over ocean. It, is, it takes forever to get anybody there. And then finally, when 
Rome gathers her bishops to begin talking about what's happening with Martin Luther. Martin Luther has pushed forward a million years. He's way beyond the questions that the church is beginning to address finally. And now he has gone way beyond what the church can accept. In the beginning, a lot of those things that he brought up um, are things that the church could have dealt with and accepted. But that's what Rome, you know, when, when I was in Rome studying, they call that early Martin Luther and later Martin Luther. Early Martin Luther, the church could have dealt with. Later Martin Luther, it was too late. But that's what happens when you don't have the internet. <laughs> okay. And now it's almost the opposite. We learn too fast. We hear too fast of things. And sometimes things are said or happen that are not accurate, right? You call it fake news or whatever. They're not accurate. And then more decisions are made over bad information. And so it's almost as if um, too much too now. Much. All right, so the next thing. There are three sections in this document. Christian life and belief is one section. That's what we're looking at uh, tonight. Sacraments, amazing, huh? I want to remind you, year 50, or maybe to the year 70, already we're going to be talking about baptism and Holy Eucharist. Whenever someone says, you guys made it up during the Middle Ages. Point to the Didache. Send them to the Didache. Say, just read this, and you'll see. We didn't make it up. It's always been there. And then finally, church organization, bishops, priests, and so forth. What do you do? How do you handle it? How do you uh, relate to the leadership? And then um, the last recap, while not canonical, authentic and accepted vision of the church uh, of the time. So remember, this document doesn't make it into the Bible, almost did. Didn't make it into the New Testament, almost did. But still, even today, is seen as authoritative and important to understanding the early church. This would be by Catholics, Orthodox, um, and the mainline Protestant churches. Evangelicals. Wow, beautiful people, beautiful people that are always amazed at what we have in our history. Um, and all, most of the time we're not aware of the church fathers and so forth. And um, so a document like this is really a wonderful talking piece with someone that's evangelical. You know, the dialogue that we had uh, with the evangelicals in Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, for the Catholic Church and the evangelicals was wonderful because it was uh, always very spiritual and very uh, powerful prayer all the time, you know, that was uh, threaded into everything. Uh, but, um, but as far as um, coming up with a theological construct or vision of of church and life and so forth, they're not there yet. They're building that. Theologians are becoming um, a real part of the evangelical world, but it's taken this long. They really have not had that. The, let's call them experts, you know, that speak on behalf of the whole church. And this is part of the problem with um, evangelical religion is that it's very autonomous. And very disconnected from each other. So, like the Baptists, you know, you hear about the Southern Baptist Convention, and they get together and they talk and so forth. But whatever they come up with, it it does it has no power or authority to to demand anything of any of that little tiny church on the corner of Maine and whatever. It's only there to give advice and counsel, but you can take it or leave it. And it doesn't make you a bad Baptist if you leave it all. Okay. Um, so much different, much different. So there's, there's a fierce independence, sense of independence, sometimes amongst um, that part of the Protestant family. But um, that's very different with um, the ancient churches, Catholic and Orthodox especially, which see a need and believe that it was set forth in the plan from the beginning. 
have leadership. Okay, next slide, please. So tonight we're looking at what's called the way of life and the way of death. This is an important umbrella, I call it umbrella view of the document that we're looking at tonight. So this is what kind of overarches over everything called the Didache. And these instructions are not meant for people who are thinking about joining the way. Remember that the first title given to this community really in the New Testament is the way. Eventually, um, we receive Catholic, and then we receive Roman Catholic uh, during the Reformation. And that was kind of a jab. Oh, you belong to the Romans, you belong to Rome. And that was not a compliment. But eventually what happens is the Catholic Church took that as a compliment. And she said, yes, we are one with Rome and one with Peter. And so that um, turned into an apologetic um, for both sides, actually, which is a little um, off because we are more than the Roman Catholic Church. There is the Eastern Catholic Churches, too. Uh, the Maronites, the Melkites, and so forth. But um, certainly in Europe, we're looking just at that time, the Roman Catholic Church, and then the New Catholics. They had lots of different names for themselves. Um, and and the, especially the Anglicans saw themselves as the true Catholics who had not lost their way. So they were one with the ancient Catholic Church, which had not grabbed on to these customs and um, like the papacy and so forth, but they were real to um, the authentic and first uh, beginnings. And uh, they held on to that for a long, long time. Uh, but I think now have probably begun to let go of that. But it took that long centuries. So they were hoping that they would be the bridge between Protestants and Catholics, and that they would be the ones to, to forge, um, again, the church anew. Okay. So these instructions that we'll read in a little bit, these are meant for people um, who have already experienced conversion. So these are people who already belong to the way and now are being reminded about what it means to belong. We don't know, as you remember, who the author is, the question mark. But this, this author sees that the, first of all, number one, the letters of the apostles and the gospels are Holy Scripture along with the Old Testament. This is a big deal, everybody. Big, big deal. So you have the author saying authoritatively, the church holds that the letters of St. Paul and the Gospels are on equal footing with the Old Testament. Remember, we don't have a New Testament yet. But we have now the beginnings of moving towards that. And this document then is saying, these are equal. That's a big shift. A Jew could never accept that. Number two, the author considers the Old Testament, um, especially the Torah, the law, to be important following the reverence and the use that Christ makes of it. In other words, um, there will be some people in trying to fashion who we are who will say we don't need the Old Testament. We should let go of the Old Testament and just use the, the letters of St. Paul and the Gospels. This is enough. And so the author here is saying, no, it's not enough. And in fact, 
the, the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures are essential to our church. And John Paul II will even go as far as to say that without the Old Testament, the church cannot understand herself. She needs the Old Testament in order to understand herself. And number three, the author wants us to trust that this follows the instruction of Christ and the apostles. The author is saying, trust me. This is what Christ wanted. This is what the apostles wanted. A unity between the letters, the gospels, and the Old Testament. So building on all of this beautiful wisdom, the Old Testament and the beginnings of the New Testament, he comes out with this wonderful title, The Way of Life, Way of Death. Next slide. A little bit of background that's very important. There is definitely a biblical worldview here. Eternal life and righteousness with God is absolutely connected to our life choices. And you will see this over and over and over again, especially in the Old Testament, that there are choices that have to be made. Adam and Eve, choices are made. Cain and Abel, choice is made. Noah and the rest of the, the people who make a choice not to believe. <clears throat> Moses, who takes the people out of Egypt, a choice is made to leave what is comfortable and to go into the desert, into mystery, into what uh, is not known, the great unknown for them. On and on and on we see this. And so the um, author reminds us that in order to be righteous, that means um, in unity with God, to be united heart to heart, we have to make the right life choices. And that should make sense to you today. Because if that isn't part of our approach, we're in trouble. If we make life choices today, not based on the gospel and not based on the wisdom of the scriptures, we have to ask ourselves if we have compromised ourselves. And the Lord is very, very stern about this. Be you not of the world, only in the world, but not of the world. So we're on a, a pilgrimage, we're on our way somewhere else. And this is why, um, as a Catholic, you will never feel completely comfortable with life here. And you will never feel completely comfortable with your, um, the government. And you will never feel completely comfortable with your political party. Okay. Because it will always fall short of the gospel. And I always think, you know, I, I before uh, President Biden uh, was elected, and uh, the only Catholic president, of course, we had was uh, President Kennedy. And I used to say all the time, we should never, never, never have a, a Catholic president. And I still believe that because I don't think they can live the teaching of the church and the um, the kind of responsibilities and decisions that they make. I don't know how they can do it. You have to take out. This guy over in the Middle East and so forth, and you're, you're making decisions that are really um, very, very complicated and delicate. And for um, a person of Catholic faith, I, I just think it's really uh, difficult and maybe too difficult. That's that's my my stance. I'd rather have someone who's not Catholic as president and then deal with that, you know, work with that. The point being, though. 
that um, the choices that we make in this world will oftentimes be opposed to the culture. So, you, you know, you remember at the time of the Roman Empire and uh, the fledgling church, that's where she finds herself um, out of that milieu. And one of the, the wonderful things that the Roman Empire used to do was infanticide. And so if you um, had a baby and it was a girl, better to just leave it in a, over a, at the dump, let the child die very quietly and so forth. And it was really a problem, not for most of Roman civilization there, but it was a huge problem for the early church. And the early church was disgusted with it and refused to see that as um, civil or as um, a, um, a decision that they could ever be involved with. So the early church fought against that and would not accept it as being uh, uh, something normative uh, in the community. And this will happen over and over again. You're gonna see you know, all the times where the church comes under fire because of her teaching of what she holds. It might be Thomas Beckett, or it could be Thomas More um, about divorce, Thomas Beckett about the rights of the church. Uh, both of them are finally martyred uh, for this, you know, Thomas Beckett, that the, the government has no right to step in into the church, tell the church how she is to run herself. And uh, Thomas More later, who, uh, because he defends the sanctity of marriage, he will not accept the divorce of Catherine of Aragon and King Henry VIII. Now Henry VIII later will have how many wives? Six. 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 And none of them do too well. <laughs> uh, only one, Anne of Cleves, who is a Protestant princess. And she marries uh, Henry VIII, who has now already broken away and created what is today the Anglican Church. And uh, after their first meeting, they both realized it was a huge mistake. Um, Henry VIII sends Holbein, who's a famous great painter at that time, to Germany uh, in order to um, do a painting of her. And he brings it back, and the king is kind of smitten by it. And then when he meets her in real person, it's not quite what she looks like. <laughs> and then poor Anne of Cleves, you know, everybody has talked about Henry VIII, who was this, you know, in his early days, he was supposed to be the handsome Renaissance pr uh, prince, um, athletic, tennis player, you know, <laughs> everything. And now, at his age now, he um, has a terrible, terrible problem with his legs, and they're in pain all the time, and there's a pus, and it smells terrible, and this is what she's marrying. <laughs> and a man with a bad temper, as you know. Well, um, what they decide, She's very clever. They decide um, to get a divorce because she knows that's the only way she's going to keep her head. <laughs> and she, she says, how about if we get a divorce, you call me your sister. I will call you my brother. I will never oppose you. I will always stay in England. Just give me a manor house and give me enough servants to take care of me and enough money to take care of me, and I will be happy as a clam. And he agrees, and he loves this because it takes away the problem. And so that's what happens. They divorce, and forever in the court, when she's announced, it's the king's sister has arrived. You know? And she does well for herself. And then secretly is meeting with Mary Tudor, who is the young daughter of Catherine of Aragon. Mary is the Catholic, right? Elizabeth, daughter of Anne Boleyn, is the Protestant. And Mary helps her in the path to conversion, and she becomes a Catholic quietly. And she lives out the rest of her life that way and um, becomes really probably the smartest of all those queens. Okay. Anyway, anyway. History. I love history. Okay, so it's very important then that choices that you make every day 
have to bring this to the gospel and to Jesus. Otherwise, you may find yourself moving in directions that are not healthy and not good for you, not good for your soul. The worldview. Secondly, choices determine your destiny. The author is really clear about this. You want to go to heaven? Make good choices. You want to go to hell? Make bad choices. Very clear. Third, biblical metaphors, it's beautiful, that had come out in this document of life as a path or a road or a journey that implies movement, progression of time, freedom to choose. So remember, choices that you make, they're your free choices. God puts before you the plan, but the adventure of life as a Christian is for you to choose. And it's, um, gosh, I can't remember who said it. It might have been C.S. Lewis who says it's also the horror of life is that we have choice. So um, very, very important. But uh, the metaphors of path, you see this all through the New Testament as well. And so even Christ himself saying, I am the way, right, the way, the truth and the lie. Or that beautiful story to, about Emmaus, when the resurrected Christ joins the travelers. And they're talking about all the sad things that have happened just recently, that Jesus, who we thought was going to be the Messiah, uh, was crucified and is now dead. And the whole thing has plummeted. The whole movement is destroyed. And Christ, so patient, is walking with them and listening. And then he says to them, how foolish you are. What fools you are. And then he begins to tell them, going back to the Old Testament, his reverence for the Old Testament. He goes back and he begins to show how uh, this ha had to happen to um, the Son of Man. And then finally, the path leads into darkness. This is all very important. Remember, when the gospel writers are putting these little incidentals, they're not incidental, they're all uh, symbolic as well. And so the, the path leads into darkness, the night has fallen, and it's dangerous. And so the travelers say to, to Christ, stay with us, for the night has fallen. And they're um, you know, concerned for him. And then our Lord says, yes, I will stay with you. Then they go into the home, and remember then he takes bread and he breaks it. And as he breaks it, it says their eyes were uh, given to see that he is the Christ. And then he disappears from their sight. Okay? The break, it happens in the breaking of the bread. Another code, more code language for Eucharist. The breaking of bread. Last Supper, all over again. So remember, it's important that you see that the things that we do today, for instance, the mass um, over centuries um, has grown and developed. Um, the way we uh, have, um, the way we look at the papacy, the Holy Father. Well, the Holy Father today is different from the Holy Father uh, from the beginning, Peter. Peter didn't wear a white robe like the Holy Father does. They didn't call him holiness and so forth. These are things that are adjusted over time, but they're not essential. But I mean, you know, honestly, if the Holy Father decided not to wear a cassock anymore and just to wear a white suit, I think it, you know, I hope he doesn't do that, but <laughs> it's not essential. Right? So we have to remember as Catholics too, that there are some things that are essential and there are some things that are not essential to what we believe and who we are. Okay. In the biblical view, then, there is no middle ground. The path to God requires courage, persistence, commitment, and humility. However, there is lots and lots and lots of room for. Um, reconciliation. 
So um, realizing that we are not a perfect people, always there is the invitation to come back to truth, come back to the path. So even at this very early stage, it's very clear the path is one way only. But um, come back if you, you move off and find yourself lost. Eventually, this will become a, a great argument in the church because there will be great persecutions. And in those persecutions, people will apostatize for fear or other reasons. They will leave the church. And we have records of um, uh, the pagan priest in uh, Rome that in order to uh, not be executed, not lose their lives, uh, Christians had to show their devotion and loyalty to the emperor. And the way they would do that is they would just put one little piece, that's all, one little piece of um, incense into uh, before the pagan god. And what's recorded is that the pagan priests were exhausted because Christians were lined up so much, so far, for day after day, night after night, to just throw in that little bit of incense. Great apostasy. And so uh, when uh, Constantine makes uh, the religion, uh, frees the religion, and, be and it becomes the religion of the empire, now the question is, well, what do we do with all these people that apostatize and now want to come back? And um, the church argues about this because there's going to be one huge element of the church that says, no, nope, they can't come back. They made their decision. That's it. It's gone. And then another, you know, the other section of the church that says there has to be mercy. And there has to be a way for everyone to come back from anything. Otherwise, the death on the cross is not enough. Otherwise, Christ dying on the cross to free us of sin is not enough. If we don't allow these people to come back. And I believe it's Pope St. Stephen who will declare that um, these people can return to the church. But they will have to do Hence. And what's developing too is the sacrament of reconciliation, which now is becoming very, very important here to bring people back into union. And all the penitential things that surround that sacrament in the beginning. Now, you know, um, you come to confession, I hear your confession, and I fit the penance to whatever it is you brought to me, right? So obviously, if something's going wrong, let's say uh, somebody confesses a, a adultery, it's not enough for me to say, just say three Hail Marys and one Our Father. Don't do it again. That's not enough. No, there has to be a little bit more of, okay, how do we take a next step so that you don't fall into this again? Is this somebody that you work with? Is this somebody that you're, you're in close connection to? You've got to break that connection. Okay, otherwise, the temptation may be too great. And that would be part of the penance, along with prayer, of course. Uh, but there may be some things that are just so simple that you do say, three Hail Marys, one Our Father, be good. No, don't worry anymore. No. But it has to fit. And so at this time, what's happening is the, um, the development, not only of church authority, but development of her sacraments, of her... Um, devotional life of penance and mortification and all these things. Fasting, which we will see in this document, is uh, very important and very, very much encouraged. Does everybody have, do we have, uh, does everybody have a copy? Great. Okay. If you would, I want you to take out your copies of the Didache. We're just going to walk through this a little bit. So there are two ways, one of life, one of death. That's verse one. And a great difference between the two. 
Verse 2, the way of life is this, you shall love the Lord your God that made you. Secondly, your neighbor is yourself. What is that? What does that remind you of? The greatest commandments. Yeah, the two great commandments of Christ. So they're drawing on the gospel. Now, of these words, the doctrine is this. Bless them that curse you, pray for your enemies, and fast for them that persecute you. For what thank is it if you love them that love you? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. But do you love them that hate you, and you shall not have an enemy? That's pure and simple Jesus Christ right there. Radical, radical. Now it's enshrined. It's cemented in. This is important. Because... It could be that they would have said, mm, you know, Christ said, love your enemy, but he was being, you know, allegorical or something. You know, it's um, you know, Christ, but, but we're not able to do that. We're not Christ. I mean, because that argument comes up, too, in sections of the, of the Orthodox Church who look at some of the ways that we deal with uh, marriage questions and so forth. And Orthodox fathers will tell me, well, you know, Christ set up us teaching, but none of us can reach it, or very few of us reach it. So the mercy of the church is that we allow, you know, a second marriage, third marriage. Okay, and it, it's kind of interesting because in Orthodox, um, uh, when you get to your third marriage, the priest is supposed to scold you <laughs> during the. Um, yeah, during the the, the ceremony, You're, you can't have you can't have flowers. You're not supposed to have music. It's supposed to be you're lucky that you're getting this last chance. But don't no 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 number four or five. Okay. So um, that's the way that um, the Orthodox have worked with this. And then there's um, you know remember that the Orthodox have not. Uh, really had a uh, ecumenical council bringing them all together because the Pope isn't there, which must be very frustrating to the Orthodox. Because for them, the Pope walked away. But because he walked away, he is the um, patriarch of the Western Church. The only way an ecumenical council can happen is if the patriarch of the Western Church is there or sends the representative. But because there's been this break, they're not able to have ecumenical councils. We have continued to have ecumenical councils because the patriarch is here. So we've had a lot, which ended up with the last, which is Vatican II. Right? So the um, uh, how important it is that we're able to move and adjust and develop. Um, the great saint of development of the church, I think, is John Henry Newman. If you ever want to, to read the development, um, what is it called? The development of um, doctrine? Yeah. It's it's a wonderful, wonderful read. Uh, you're not going to read it real quick, I, you know, I can guarantee you, but it's, it's good. And um, when I was talking to the um, the Coptics, no, the Armenians, you know, for a suicide, according to their their teaching, because they they have not looked at it from the the vantage point of psychology and everything else, it's still the old old way. Uh, for a suicide, the the body has to be turned over in the casket because the, the, the message is don't do this. This is not good. This creates damage, um, certainly for the soul, but for the family and so forth. This is probably akin to what we used to do, too. Remember, you could not bury a suicide in. Um, on holy ground. Okay. Now, uh, thankfully, uh, the church, uh, she will bury, and with the hope that eternal life is there. And, and a beautiful understanding of it's just too difficult for us to judge, and we shouldn't. 
and we should leave that up to Jesus Christ to judge, and we should hope. Okay. Number uh, four, abstain from fleshly and bodily lust. If any man give you a blow on the right cheek, turn to him the other, and you shall be perfect. If a man impress you to go with him one mile, go with him two miles, twain. If a man take away your cloak, give him also your coat, and so forth. So again, pure Jesus Christ here. But let's read between the lines. Abstain from fleshly and bodily lust. Well, guess what's going on? Guess what's going on all around the church? Guess what's going on in the church? And so the reminder, this is how we read this between the lines. It's telling us of what's happening at the time in the life of the church. To every man that asks of you, give and ask not back. For the Father desires that gifts be given to all of his own bounties. Blessed is he that gives according to the commandment, for he is guiltless. Woe to him that receives. For if a man receives having need, he is guiltless, but he that hath no need shall give satisfaction why and wherefore he received. And being put into confinement, he shall be examined concerning the deeds that he has done, and he shall not come out hence until she has given he has given back the last farthing. That comes again from who? Jesus Christ, remember the parable about the, the man who uh, uh, is uh, free from what he owes, and instead of being grateful, another, there's another man that owes something to him, and, he's, and he takes the guy and throws him into jail and destroys his life until he can get you know, every penny back, and then the master says, you wicked servant, you did this and did not I give you mercy. Yet you have not shown mercy. So this is the pure Jesus Christ again. Yea, as touching this also, it is said, let thine arms sweat into thine hands until thou shalt have learned to whom to give. Be wise how you give. Chapter two. This is the second commandment of the teaching. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not corrupt boys. You shall not commit fornication. You shall not steal. You shall not deal in magic. You shall do no sorcery. You shall not murder a child by abortion, nor kill them when born. You shall not cover your neighbor's goods. Right. So here we have not only uh, ten commandments that are brought forth again, but again, what's happening right now in the life of the church. Right now at this time, um, magic, people are getting into magic and sorcery. Wow, is that new? Or today, or well, you come from my culture, Spanish, brujeria, all over the place. You know, um, this threading together of Christian or Catholic faith and pagan belief, really, really bad. Um, the uh, Ouija board. The uh, all this this kind of stuff. Um, when I did that four years of work for Deliverance Ministry and Exorcism, I'm telling you, um, people will say, "Well, Father, we didn't really believe it. It doesn't matter if you don't believe it. It believes it. You know? And if the door is open, the door is open, and those doors are hard to close. And it takes a lot of uh, prayer, a lot of commitment, and um, a lot of heartache." to do that and so it's very very important that we don't get involved in superstition uh magic or sorcery and witchcraft um, but you see it out there um abortion here it is so it's a threat already to the community enough that the community has to talk about it, it has to be put into this um, teaching the corruption of boys look at that so, in a way, it's kind of like nothing new under the sun, right? So, um, there is sort of this understanding, this kind of feeling like, my gosh, this has never happened. All sin is sin. It's been happening from the beginning. It will happen till the end. But it's important for the church to recognize and to say, to speak, that these things are not of us. 
These cannot be things that we are involved in because it corrupts the soul. You shall not perjure, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not speak evil, you shall not cherish a grudge. This is all being put on the same level, right? <laughs> okay. You shall not be double minded, nor double tongued. Forget the gossip, forget the talking about others behind their backs. Okay. Forget about being nice and sweet to people in front of you, and then the minute they turn their backs, it's something completely different. Happens a lot in the church. Happens a lot in the church. Causes a lot of hurt and pain in the church. Your word shall not be false or empty, but fulfilled by action. You shall not be avaricious, nor a plunderer, nor a hypocrite, nor ill-tempered, nor proud. You shall not entertain an evil design against your neighbor. You shall not hate any man. But some you shall reprove, for others shall you pray, and others uh, you shall love more than your life. That's pretty, isn't it? That's nice. So sometimes you have to actually um, say to somebody, this is not good. Please think about it. Please. Uh, the metaphor um, that I use or, you know, um, oftentimes is step away from the cliff. Because a lot of times in our sins, we get close to a cliff and we're ready to just go right over into disaster. And it's important that we pull away from the cliff and get to uh, safe ground again. My child, chapter three, flee from every evil, everything that resembles it. Don't be angry for anger leads to murder, nor jealous, nor contentious, nor wrathful for all these things murders are engendered. Do not be lustful, for lust leads to fornication, neither foul speaking, neither with uplifted eyes, for all these things adulteries are engendered. My child be no dealer in omens, since it leads to idolatry, nor an enchanter, nor astrologer, uh, nor a magician. Either be willing to look at them, for from all these things idolatry is engendered. My child be not a liar, since lying leads to theft. Either avaricious, either vainglorious, for from all these things, thefts are engendered. Be not a murmurer, since it leads to blasphemy. Either self willed thinker, a thinker of evil thoughts, from all these things, blasphemies are engendered. But be meek, since the meek shall inherit the earth. Be long suffering and pitiful, and godless and quiet, kindly and always fearing the words which you have heard. You shall not exalt yourself, neither shall you admit boldness into your soul. Your soul shall not cleave together with the lofty, but with the righteous and humble shall you walk. Accidents that befall you shall you receive as good, knowing that nothing is done without God. There's a lot of great lessons in this. First of all, just how beautiful it is. You're giving, you know, the author is giving some heavy, heavy counsel and begins every piece with my child. Very tender. So it's almost like a parent speaking and saying, please, you may not know why, but believe me, this is what it goes to. This is what it leads to. And um, how important it is then to, to see that things lead to other things. And there is what we call the occasion of sin. I think in some of our, you know, we do the our old uh, um, uh, prayers at the end of confession. Uh, oh my God, I'm most heartily sorry for having offended thee, and so forth. And um, we always have in that the occasion of sin. You know, uh, I will avoid the, the occasion of sins, and and that's a real helpful thing. And I think sometimes we forget that before we fall into mortal sin. We've had a lot of steps before that where we could have veered off, but we just kept moving that direction. And then when we find ourselves there, we panic, you know, um, because mortal sin always bites and it will always come back to haunt if it's not dealt with. This is why it's so beautiful to bring into confession 
If you have heavy regrets, you haven't confessed them, bring them to confession. Get rid of it. Get rid of the burden on conscience. Get rid of the burden on your mind. Things that have happened in the past that you regret that were maybe really bad, really sinful, they will find their place in the plan of God and in your heart. You can't forget these things. You know, forgive and forget. Impossible. Forgive, yeah, but you can't forget. That's because you're a human. you got a mind. You have memory. But the things that go wrong because of forgiveness and because of the mercy of God, we can find where they fit into our lives in a place where they won't affect us negatively anymore, but they will actually help us to be better people. Um, I was talking to um, a priest, uh, a theologian from uh, back east, and he was saying how important it is to deal with the things that you interiorly sorrow about and hurt about, because these are the things that will not allow you yet to enter the kingdom of heaven. These are the things that will need purification. And he said, if you want to make your path quickly to heaven, take care of these things now. So that when you leave this world, you don't leave with all that baggage. But instead, it's been dealt with in this world. And you will make your way quickly, smoothly to the kingdom. And I, I think that's right on. Um, some of us don't deal with things that happen. We ignore them or whatever. But it's important to bring them to Jesus. Um, Jesus forgives through the church. The church has some power of herself. It's only Christ who works through her. Right? Uh, the sacraments are nothing. Uh, Christ isn't there, of course. And, but he is there, and because of that, it's the perfect prayer. Uh, the perfect communication with God happens through our, our sacraments. Uh, and so it's important that we take advantage of what's been gifted and given to us for freedom's sake, so that we don't um, carry things anymore. We're not burdened by things anymore. We're not anxious at night. We're not afraid of people, afraid of what they're going to say, uh, afraid of things that might go wrong, afraid that the world might end in three days, afraid that China might do this or that or whatever. I mean, these are all things. There's, of course, human concern, but should not steal away or rob you of your peace. All right, 15 minute break. Now we're talking a lot about right about freedom and choice and choosing to belong to Christ, choosing to belong to the church and what that means. And so we're going to have a invitation. I'll ask Don to come forward, a beautiful invitation that you can all uh, help us with. Thank you, Father Al. Um, so uh, I want to just tell you a very brief uh, announcement about the Christian initiation of adults, or RCA, as it's sometimes called. Uh, this week on Monday, Father John called together a meeting of his RCI te RCIA team this year. Uh, Father Al, uh, Deacon Steve, uh, Greg Gretchen Dinger, back in the back, and myself. The result is that the RCIA will start this year on uh, Tuesday, September 6th, uh, from 6.30 to uh, 8 o'clock here, right here in room one. So we have the schedule ready to go. Uh, and uh, now, given the group of people in this room, it's very likely that anyone <clears throat> in here is uh, interested in signing up for RCIA. Um, however, the message tonight 
is about your friends, your co-workers, your family members. Uh, think about that and uh, uh, you know, help uh, suggest or guide uh, uh, some of those people. Um, and then uh, the other thing you know, we also need is that everyone in the RCI class also has a sponsor. Now, many of them will bring a sponsor with them, uh, again, a, a friend or family member, but we also need volunteers to be sponsored so we can uh, uh, match up some people who maybe don't automatically have a sponsor. So uh, please let me know after we finish tonight if uh, uh, anyone would like to be a, a volunteer as a sponsor. Thank you. Thank you, Don. If you look at your dedicate um, chapter four, We'll run over a lot of what we've already received in Chapter 3. There's a little bit of variance on it. I'll let you read that later yourself. Let's move to Chapter 5. But this is the way of death. All right. First of all, it is evil and full of a curse murders, adulteries, lusts, fornications, thefts, idolatries, magical arts, witchcrafts, plunderings, false witnessing, hypocrisies, doubleness of heart, treachery, pride, malice, stubbornness, covetousness, foul speaking, jealousy, boldness, exultation, boastfulness. This is all gospel. Persecutors of good men, hating truth, loving a lie, not perceiving the reward of righteousness, not cleaving to the good nor to righteous judgment, <laughs> wakeful not for that which is good, but for that which is evil, from whom gentleness and forbearance stand aloof, loving vain things, pursuing a recompense, not pitying the poor man not toiling for him that is oppressed with toil, not recognizing him that made them, murderers of children, corruptors of the creatures of God, turning away from him that is in want, pressing him that is afflicted, advocates of the wealthy, unjust judges of the poor, altogether sinful. May you be delivered, my children, from all these things. Well, it is pretty much the flip side of what we had of the way of life, right? And it's covering uh, a lot of the same um, problems and issues of the day. But notice too, that there's an awful lot about the poor that keeps coming up. The one that is in need, the one that needs assistance and help and so forth. This is really the hallmark of Christianity, the hallmark of Catholicism, especially that sacraments and devotional life lead to action. Okay. So all the wonderful things we do by prayer, rosary, adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, Holy Mass, they are never, never to be privatized. But you are meant to move out and forward to be, remember we talked about it last week, missionaries, missionary disciples. This is something every, uh, let's see, every pontificate, there are certain themes that um, a pope will just stress over and over again. And one of the great themes that Pope Francis keeps stressing is that every Catholic is responsible for the health of the church and for the message of the gospel. Every Catholic is a missionary disciple or isn't. Remember, we speak, we say, oh, he's a good Catholic, or he's a bad Catholic. But you're a Catholic, <laughs> you know? So once you're baptized into the faith, um, this is the faith that judges you and will judge you at the end before Christ. This is the commitment, the bonding you make with Jesus Christ through the Catholic Church. And it will be all of these things. See, this is what's 
but we hold to be Catholic in the sense that um, on Judgment Day, um, Christ will not ask you how many rosaries you prayed. These are beautiful things, don't get me wrong, and I'm not saying that the rosary isn't instrumental, and even I think for a Catholic, I would even go so far as to say essential to the, the worldview that we're supposed to have. You know, that, that understanding, devotion to the Mother of God and to the saints, it's, it's all part of everything. Um, but um, remember that Christ tells us when we come before him, he shall ask, did you visit the one in prison? Did you give your cloak to the one who had need? Did you feed the hungry and give to the thirsty and so forth? These are the things that judge us, charity. And charity finds its perfection in faith and religion. So the stronger and closer we are to Jesus Christ, the more and more we have to, even it becomes natural, I think, we have to um, respond to the needs in the world. Okay. And remember, Holy Father Francis says, it's not enough to write a check for $500 and send that. Write the check if you have to, but give it to the person that it goes to. He says the relational piece is very important. It's not enough to just send checks out. But there has to be some kind of relational piece happening with those who are suffering, those who are in need, and so forth. Why do we give up meat during Lent? Well, because meat was uh, always seen as an expensive thing, right? Well, there certainly is in some countries, I'm sure, in Africa and other places. Meat is not something that, you know, we go here to pavilions and you've got rows and rows of whatever kind of meat you want and everything else. I remember when I was in Guatemala, I was sent there as a missionary and walking into their supermarkets and it, it astounded me. I've never in my life seen such a thing where you have something as big as pavilions and maybe there's um, a little bit of bread here, some you know butter there, but it was like, you know, elements had run through the whole place and, and everything was turned over and gone. And it's poverty, it's poverty. And it's the kind of thing that we're not used to as um, Americans. And it's shocking to us that we're in a recession, you know, but I tell you, we're not, in a place like um, most of the rest of the world, even, even though we'd be in a recession. So still, we have to have some kind of response, some kind of movement outside of ourselves. To give you a, an example, there was a, a woman who needed help, uh, and I was talking to her in Spanish, and uh, she had her mother with her who was, looked like she was in her late 80s or 90s. And, um, She's trying very much to um, convince me that she's the real thing and she's just not trying to get money. Um, but she has a job lined up. Uh, it starts actually the next day, but she doesn't have enough to, to cover, you know, today for a hotel or whatever. So I listened and, and then I said, well, wait here. I'll, let me see what I can do. And I went to my uh, house and I, I'm thinking about it, talking to God, and I said, Lord, well, I think she should at least get, I can get her $20. I said, it's just not a big deal. It's not going to affect me one way or the other to lose $20. Or, and then as I'm going through to where I have, you know, some, my wallet, and I think, well, gosh, $20 isn't very much. You know, here I'm, I'm a priest. I should be a little bit more, you know. And I go, well, I give, I give her $50 of like this. And then I'm kind of rumbling through things and rummaging through things. And, and then um, there's a $100 bill from, you know, because, you know, my mother died. And so some people have sent, you know, some very nice cars. And sometimes there's a, a check or somebody sent me a $100 bill. And I said, oh, I don't want to do this. But I will do this. I will do it. And it, because even for me, it's a little hard to, you know, I'm, I'm being honest with you, just stretch like that. And but I said, okay, all right, all right, I'm going to give it, and I'm going to do it joyfully. <laughs> so I get out there and I give it to her, 
Yes, we feel very, very grateful. And then I said, let me give you a, a blessing and a prayer though. Oh, thank you. Okay. And so I, I prayed over them in, in Spanish and I gave them a blessing and then sent them on their way. And I, and I gave her a, a little flyer leaflet thing called the Novena Surrender, which I'm a big fan of. Father uh, Dolindo. Wow, 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 wow. Anyway, that's for another day. But I gave it to her and I said, I'm sorry it's not in, in Spanish, but, but please pray this. Surrendering to, to Christ. She, yes, Father, okay. So, all right. So I go back to my house. I sit down. I'm like, okay, hey, Lord, that was for you. And I <laughs> open up an envelope. And guess what falls out? Another <laughs> <laughs> like, Praise God. <laughs> I knew you would come through. I knew you would do this. And this has always been my experience. When we stretch, and I and I have to force myself to stretch, but when we stretch, it always comes back. Christ never leaves me without. And he's been so overly generous to me forever that um, I never am behind. I'm never without. I'm never, you know, feeling like I'm... Uh, you know, losing my security or, or anything like that to be charitable. It always gives back. And so um, I, I really encourage you on that, you know, to do that. And, you know, I, I send money to the Ukrainian university for years before all this happened and I'm still sending them. You know, there, we all have charities that we, we love. Ronald McDonald House, some beautiful things that maybe aren't even Catholic. And they don't need to be. That sometimes the Catholic Church cannot touch and reach those places where other churches can, or other groups that aren't even religious, but they do good work. But don't forget your parish. Now, I was a pastor in two different churches, and I'm not afraid to talk about money. It never happened. <laughs> because it's reality. And because um, I believe it's a gift that all of you have, the ability to, to share. And you share it in the way you share it. But don't forget your parish. Because this is the way that you build up your St. Anne's. You know? And um, there's lots of things that I put money into when, when I was uh, living at Blessed Sacrament. Um, I wasn't a priest of the parish, although I helped. Um, but I joyfully gave money to, you know, we're going to put up a statue of St. Jude, or we're going to put a statue up, a marble statue of St. Joseph. Beautiful, beautiful to it. Make the church more beautiful. Great. Uh, we have to take down the stained glass windows because they haven't been, you know, looked at in 75 years. They're gorgeous, the ones that bless the sacrament. And um, we want to make sure that they're going to last for another 75 years. Great. Here. You know, because this is... You know, at the end, when I come before God, I mean, who cares about money at that point, right? Who cares? And if I'm able to do something that will last in charity and at the parish or the diocese or whatever, then do it joyfully. Tithing. Gosh, we're not really big on it. But I'm telling you, it's biblical. It's biblical. The 10% is biblical. And we need to stretch to that so that this is the reason why so that you will not be mastered by money so that it will not be the master of your life causing you insecurity and anxiety but you will be master of what you receive and then you shall give as the dedicate says and you give not grinding your teeth but you give joyfully that makes sense all right because i want to see the collection go up <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's what money's for, right? <laughs> Did you ever see Hello Dolly? Yeah. Yeah. With uh, Barbara Streisand, right? Yeah. Uh, what a wonderful movie, musical. And remember, she says that's what money is for. It's meant to be small, about it. You know, she's a uh, uh, wonderful, wonderful um, character in in that uh, movie. But but that's true. Why be um captive to this and why not as a christian use it for the good and realizing again that whatever you give christ will give back 
He will not leave you orphan. No, trust him. He will get back. He will take good care of you. Chapter six, very short now. See, lest any man lead you astray from the way of righteousness, for he teaches you apart from God. Okay, watch who you hang out with. For if you are able to bear the whole yoke of the Lord, you shall be perfect. But if you are not able, do that which you are able to do. Concerning eating, bear that which you are able. Yet abstain by all means from meat sacrificed to idols, for it is a worship of dead gods. I love that. It's a worship of dead gods. So many gods surrounding the, the new church. The Roman gods, the Greek gods, the Egyptian gods, the Mediterranean religions, the mystery religions. And then here's this religion that says there is one God, three persons. You shall honor and adore him only, and for him you shall even lay down your life, and they will do that. For all those that apostatize, but for the ones that don't, the ones that apostatize, they're footnotes in history. The ones that don't, we know their names. They're beautiful, beautiful names. St. Agatha, St. Cecilia, St. Valentine, on and on and on, and the annals of the church. Wonderful stories. You know St. Cecilia, right? She uh, is this uh, part of the, the royalty of um, the empire and beautiful, and they want to marry her off, but she is a believer. She has given herself to Christ, and the man that wants to really marry her is Valentine. And uh, she says no. And then she tells him, well, if you get baptized, and he says, well, I don't know about that. And then and if she says, well, if you be baptized, you will see angels because they come to me. And so it is said during the baptism, he goes ahead with it because he's in love with her, because he really wants her as his wife. He goes ahead. How many times does this happen? Hi, Father. Yeah, I'd love to be um, Catholic. Uh, why? Well, because... You know, my boyfriend, um, he's Catholic, and if we're going to get married, you know, their family feels real strongly about it. So I'm, you know, okay. Yeah. All right. and, and then they become really good Catholics. You know, a, a lot of our really on fire Catholics are people that come through our CIA. And they teach us to appreciate anew what we already, you know, have had. So he, um, Anyways, being baptized, and he sees angels coming down from heaven, and he has this great spiritual experience, and then um, he becomes an evangelizer, he becomes a missionary. And the two of them become a couple missionaries. And eventually, um, he is murdered, and the uh, left in the streets on purpose, because it was a dreadful thing for a body not to be cared for after death for Romans. This was a terrible, terrible thing to just have a body laying out in the street. But um, this was the way they were going to capture Cecilia. And it worked. She would not leave her husband out in the streets. And she went to gather his body, and then they um, take her prisoner. And eventually, um, there are a lot of um, uh, the torture and so forth that they inflict on her. And finally, um, they cut her throat. And as she is dying, it takes a, a couple of days for her to die. Um, she, uh, people are coming and she is teaching them catechism. And then she dies with her hand out this way, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, final testimony of the Blessed Trinity. They opened her um, tomb at least three times, I remember. And each time she has been incorruptible. So her body has not decayed in any way. And there's that very famous statue of St. Cecilia laying down as she's dying with her hand out. And in, um, in that testimony of the Trinity, that's the way they found her body. So they had an artist make it from what they saw uh, in her tomb centuries later. So I mean, there's these great, great 
um, stories, wonderful stories. And, and some of them, some of the saints, we can't remember them too much anymore, but we have their names and we have little, little tiny details like St. Valentine. There's many St. Valentines, you know, and, um, uh, but they, they all represent um, a time when they stood strong with the faith and they are included now in the calendar of the church. So the church never forgets them. So we just did celebrate St. Eusebius, and we have all these saints that come from really misty times, but we, we try not to forget. And we try to remember why we should remember the modeling that comes from knowing them and loving them. Okay. Um, we're going to stop there because the next week we begin with sacraments. So that's chapter seven. So now that you have your Didache, um, please uh, read chapter seven, chapter eight, chapter nine, chapter 10. Yeah, up to chapter 10, okay? It's not long. And then yellow, whatever you need to yellow and whatever you think uh, you might wanna ask a question about and so forth. So we have run to a quarter till nine. I'm sorry about that. I try to keep us at 8.30. But do you have a question or are we okay? Wow, what a wonderful group you are. <laughs> okay, all right. So we're going to close here. If you want to invite a friend to come next time, please do, because we're now going to be talking about sacraments. So it still will be interesting, I think, and instructive, especially because this is a big piece of Catholicism that people need to know um, goes all the way back to the beginnings. Okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you and praise you, Lord, on this day for your saints. And we ask John Vianney and his tenderness and goodness to look down upon us, to look down upon the parish of St. Anne, and to um, bring us uh, closer and closer to the one he loved so much, Jesus Christ, so that we may reign eternally in heaven with all the saints, giving uh, adoration and joy and praise to God who created, who redeemed us, and who sanctifies us. Glory be to the Father, to the, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Good night, everybody. God bless. Amen. Thank you. Please leave the chairs and tables down. Please leave the chairs and tables down. Thank you.